Hi, Maria. Hi, Anand. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And you? I'm okay. Thank you for having me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, it's it's my pleasure. Uh, so, uh, Maria Batarra, uh, Batarra, <laughs> she's uh, she's a senior lecturer at the University of Bath. She works with operation research and with a lot of experience on uh, routing problems, scheduling, and combinator optimization. Works with metaheuristics, integer programming. She has a lot of papers, uh, very, very nice career. And uh, actually, she was my first international uh, co-author. Uh, I, I mean, we met nearly 10 years ago now. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, now she's my first guest in this project of interviewing people from our field. So I'm I'm so happy to have you here, Maria, as my first first guest. It's an honor, <laughs> and, and I hope it's going to be a good start. Oh yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. I, I take full advantage of these uh, being the first one. I'm your guinea pig, but uh, I know that the next uh, speakers to come are going to be fantastic researchers. So I'm really honored to be in your series of interviews. Oh come on, you're just Thank you're you. just too humble. No, no, you you do. Uh, of course, you all know that mm -hmm. you're a great. A researcher and uh, if I mean it's it's very nice to have this opportunity to, to talk to you and uh, right so I, I I think I'm not sure if I got you in in some uh, bad moment because I think you 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 have you're under lockdown right in UK oh gosh this year what can you expect from 2020 yeah I'm afraid UK is uh, currently in a very funny situation such as we cannot move from here to anywhere. Basically, all the flights have been uh, um, altered, given that there seems to be a new variation of the virus. It's not in my area of England. So far, my region is fine. But yeah, it's 2020 at its best, really. <laughs> Brexit coming in. Oh. But uh, so far, we are healthy. What else can you expect? Yeah, I totally understand. Here in Brazil, things uh, are not actually uh, not that much great. Better, is it? Yeah, yeah, mm. but well, but uh, let's talk about good, good things. And uh, I, I just, I would like to start uh, asking you. Uh, I mean, how how did everything start? Uh, like, I know you're from southern Italy, right? From Riccione, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, somewhere in the middle of Italy, yes, same region ah, okay. as uh, Bologna. So ah. I started in Bologna for my undergrad and master. At the, at the time, it was a single five-year program. Uh, but my hometown is a little touristic town on the seaside, on the Adriatic Sea. And mm -hmm. it's somewhere in the middle of Italy, really. Oh, right. Yeah. So, like, uh, you, you, uh, you, do you, like, you did you pick, like, industrial engineering, right, for, for you? Uh, yeah, well, if you want to translate it literally, it's management engineering. But ah, there okay. was a lot of uh, mechanical engineering. So, I think it's fair to say it was industrial engineering. Yeah. It's a long discussion with my husband <laughs> about it. In, here in Brazil, uh, the, the the common term is uh, production engineering, and some in the mm. in the past it was very common to have a, an emphasis. So, in my case, I studied mechanical production engineering. So I think we end mm. up doing similar courses with a lot of mechanical background there. Yes, I think so. I think the the closest match in a U.S. based system would be industrial engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything started because I started to attend these units taught by Professor Todd. Ah, okay. And the uh, professor Hugo, and it was the introduction to operational research, and not all bad. my <laughs> all my classmates were like, "What is this? I'm not interested. Just give me more logistics." And I found it pretty charming. I was really like, "Oh, this is very nice. How will I solve this problem?" I found it very interesting. So I asked for my dissertation in operational research. I asked to Professor Vigo and he said, well, I think you could improve your English. And he was very much right. And he sent me for three months for a master dissertation at the University of Maryland. I had uh, the great privilege to work with uh, uh, Professor Golden over there. And I was not even supposed to do anything very computational. I was just supposed to improve my English, do a, you know, and managerial dissertation and I, t I turned out to do some research at the end uh, and it was a great way to see really what a PhD is. Professor Golden treated me more like a PhD student rather than a master's student so he allowed me in all the meetings with his PhD students in his house on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> 
That's awesome. And that's where I learned the basics and how the life of a PhD student in operational research could be. So you had introduction by Todd and Vigo, and then you mm -hmm. work with just just the, the, the next guy you, you met was Bruce Golden. Not bad. Yes. <laughs> Not bad I'm at passing all. passing through Professor Caprara, if you ask oh, me. Oh, yeah, 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 the late, late. A bit late, intimidating, yeah, yeah. if you ask. Yeah, yeah. It was a bit intimidating. Uh, yeah, I was very lucky. Uh, Bologna is a great place to study operational research. There is a fantastic team and uh, um, you have the opportunity to really learn from the best people. And uh, yes, especially the second unit that I took, that was an optional unit, was very, with a very small group of uh, students. And uh, Professor Caprara was very inspiring to all of us. Mm -hmm. All of us were really fascinated by the subject at the end of that uh, unit. Yeah. So uh, that's yeah, where it started. It, yeah, it's a pity we, it's no longer with us, right? Uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, I, I didn't meet him, but I'm sure he was a great guy. Everybody talks very good things about I him. Apologies for the cat. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> the, the cat with an Indian name, right? Yes, he is. does have an Indian <laughs> name. Yeah, no, Professor Caprara was a, an amazing mind. It was clear to me that when I was speaking with him, his brain was working like 10 times the speed as mine. He was uh, an amazing teacher that uh, really passionate about what he was doing and clearly uh, remarkably gifted in uh, research. Um, if you ask me, probably his, uh, his speech at my uh, master dissertation was what convinced me really to go for the PhD. Oh. I, when I did my defense, it's a sort of little talk. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, uh, yeah we, have, um, we have that here too. There is a chat of the head of the jury, if you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, the, at that time, exactly at that time, I had one job offer from a big consultancy firm on the table. And then this, there could be the possibility of doing a PhD with uh, Professor Vigo. So a possible scholarship, but not certain. And uh, Professor Caprara made this speech about uh, don't go for what uh, seems to be the best way, just go for what you like the best. That's um, very inspiring, actually. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can say so, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I ended up to start my PhD. So you went to Maryland, barely, like, with barely uh, knowing any English, uh, yeah. as far as, uh, as I could understand. And how, how did you manage there? Like, it's, it could, uh, I think, it, I'm sure it, will, it was a challenge. Uh, so how, how, like, just to, to, like, find friends and interact with people and... I know that uh, sometimes when you are hungry, <laughs> you you, some, you somewhat find your, your way. But can you tell more, tell like a little bit more about what, how was the process, and how did you ev like the evolution of uh, mastering uh, the English? Mm. Um, first, I will say that the nice part of studying for a PhD in Italy, in Spain, and few other European countries is that. Uh, we are often given the opportunity of uh, spending a period abroad. So it's quite common and it's something that, for example, in my case, it was Professor Vigo that brought up this idea. And um, and I was crazy enough to say, hey, I mean, everyone does go abroad. Why shouldn't I be able to do it? And my family never made me travel abroad. They never took vacations abroad. So I, th I think I was completely just uh, unaware of the difficulties. And uh, I just said, well, everyone does it, so I should be able to cope with it. And, and that was the case. Sometimes if you overthink situations, you manage to uh, miss on opportunities. Um, I think sometimes you just need to take this leap of faith and get yourself on a plane, arrive there, just try your best, work hard, and learn day by day. And you, I think you touched on something important that is the socialization aspect. I was surrounded by fantastic friends that I could count on and they could count on me. So if you make an effort to reach out to people in situations, especially similar to yours, uh, I think you can create the most wonderful friendships when you are abroad. Um, so don't be too scared. You will learn just <laughs> go day by day. So how old were you when, when you went there? 
I think I was 24. Ah, okay, okay. 24, and it was a few months experience. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but I will strongly recommend it if you have the chance to go abroad with an Erasmus exchange or something of that sort. Even if you're thinking of an industrial career, they, when I was interviewing for industrial positions, they were immediately pointing out that, that experience abroad. And when they were switching over to English in the interview, I think you have such a big advantage if you have had the chance uh, to practice and to be surrounded in a by a English speaking community. So yeah, if you have the possibility, just go for it. Don't overthink it. Yeah, right. So uh, the the friends you mentioned, like you, they all went with you, or you met them there. Were they Americans? Were they foreigners? So how was uh, the, the lucky part and. <laughs> Very rare, actually, to find was that I didn't find any Italians there. Okay. It's the only place in the world in which I couldn't find Italians. Fine. So I had friends from Israel, I had friends from uh, Spain, I had friends from Greece, I had friends from the US, uh, and I had to speak English. There was not a chance to speak Italian. Um, and that was the only way in which I started to be a bit more fluent. Could you ever not imagine? Could you ever imagine Sorry, that would be? Ahead. Can you imagine? Can, could you ever imagine that will, you would be uh, teaching in a British university uh, it, oh. <laughs> at that time? Uh, no, not really. At the time, I was not. I, I didn't even know what a PhD was. That's okay. that's my family is not made of academics. Uh, my father worked in the industry all his life. Uh, and when I started my studies, I didn't know what a PhD student was. Um, but it was incredibly helpful to be in a business school in which the atmosphere is very motivating, very engaged. Uh, people are working incredibly hard and they're so passionate about their research to fully appreciate what a PhD is. I think I would have never embarked in a PhD without touching it. Uh, first and being in a research environment before. Um, so I think it was very inspiring. Your siblings, I think one of them has a PhD, right? Yeah, my uh, younger brother has a PhD, but he's three years younger. Mm -hmm. So he came after me. Somehow for him it was easier ah, okay. uh, because he kind of knew what the process of academia was. And what did your parents uh, think of all of that like you just came home and said look I'm doing a PhD and then and what did they say like sure kid go ahead or what I think that it's, that could be can you can you do you remember my mom was shocked when I studied engineering for her it was like she cried for days like what can a woman do as an engineer I mean engineers are these middle-aged men with a belly and uh, and they shout so my mom was ready for any sort of shock at that point. Oh. Uh, no, I think she liked, she uh, somehow liked the idea that I would stay at the university. You know, she was not uh, concerned about my future. She thought I would find my way. And my father was very supportive as well. He always told me that whatever I will do, uh, he was certain I would have worked hard and I would have managed. Um, so they were um, supportive, but in Italy it's very scary to do a PhD because academic positions are very rare. Yeah. So, um, no, they were brave and they say just do whatever you like, we will support you and we are sure that you will work hard for it. So it was, uh, it was all right. <laughs> Many people think that uh, the, when you, when you pursue like an academic career in like doing PhD and all that, it, it means that mm -hmm. you're trying to uh, find yourself later in a university or something like that, but that's not really necessary, right? You can, mm -hmm. depending on, the, especially the country you are, you may have other yeah. types of opportunities uh, by having a PhD. Uh, but when when you like decided to do and go for it, like you you had in mind that you wanted to be like a researcher and teaching and, and be involved in teaching, mm -hmm. or you were like, let's see uh, what happens and uh, I'll go from there afterwards. So did you have any plan in mind? I always knew that I would have loved being a teacher. 
teaching is something that I was always passionate and I found uh, always um, deeply satisfying. When a student learns something new and I see their eyes lit up for me, it's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah, I can totally so relate. Teaching, <laughs> it's, it's something that was always with me. I knew that teaching was uh, something that I would have always enjoyed doing. Research grew on me. I was, I think there is a big, um, at least for the people that have my kind of upbringing or my character, I was terrified of doing research. I thought it was only for the 0.01% of geniuses that can change the world and revolutionize the world with science and you need to be a super amazing mind to do research. So I was always terrified I couldn't do it because I wouldn't have been as brilliant as others. Um, I think it's uh, one of those uh, uh, big uh, stumbling blocks and issues that a lot of, especially girls, are concerned about uh, pursuing an academic job and doing research because they think they are not enough or they cannot uh, achieve genius level <laughs> kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's uh, this, uh, my supervisor was good with that. He said, don't worry, it's craftsmanship. He used that word. He said, you know, it's something, it's a job at the end. Mm -hmm, it's something right. that you learn day by day. You try things and you try them again and then you realize what works well, what doesn't work well. And the ideas build over time. Um, and the more I do this job, the more I also realize that there is space for, especially in operational research, uh, there is space for many and with uh, different talents. And um, new students shouldn't be as concerned about research and their contribution. They need to work hard. They need to have some creative side. Um, but... Uh, not everyone that is a professor has to be uh, Einstein genius level. Um, so research grew on me. It's, it was something that at the very beginning I was really concerned about. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I, if I got it right. Uh, before applying for the master's, you, you spent that period abroad or that was during the master's? That is... Yeah, it's a bit confusing because at the time in Italy, there was no differentiation between bachelor and master. Mm. So if you were studying engineering, you were just embarking into a five year long program. Okay. So there was only one dissertation at the end of the five years. Uh, and that's where I went uh, uh, to the US. Ah, okay, so the, the entire process to, to uh, since you went after starting the university and getting the master's uh, degree took five years or something? Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. It's a single title of study, but you basically don't have anything in between that is the bachelor degree. Mm. And then during my studies, mine was the last year, actually. But uh, traditionally in Italy, engineering is five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here uh, it's, it's the same, but except that if you want to do master's, you usually have to invest two more years. So to get mm. a, a bachelor degree and a master's degree, if you don't like, if you do everything correctly, it takes roughly seven years. In my case, it, wow. I, I, I did that, mind. and then I, and another four years for the PhD. And and it's yeah, I uh, think in Europe it's quite standard now after the Bologna. Um, process of standardizing the degrees. So they are three plus two mm -hmm. or three plus one. Ah, okay. In England, now it's actually just one year, the master. Yeah, here you, in some courses you have to write, this, uh, uh, we call it sort of a monograph or some small research you have to do at the end of the course. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like a small, very simple master's dissertation with just uh, nothing really big, but uh, it's something that engage you uh, in, in some some sort of uh, research work uh, as an undergrad, mm -hmm. and of course that give you some background if you want to enroll, you know, after, later on in the master's program. Uh, so it was during that period that you 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 really start started to have the the taste and 
got enthusiastic mm-hmm. about it and like did you have to pick up some at the time uh, uh, a research theme a research topic uh, or that was just kind of given to you uh, do you have any recollection it's a funny story Anand. and <laughs> you should then have asked them. okay <laughs> <laughs> okay um, so the when I departed for the US my team was supposed to be the practice of uh, garbage collection and recycling in the US. Okay. So my supervisor had an interest in this area. I was pursuing it in Italy. So he was trying to compare and contrast the two countries and the practices. So waste collection, right? Art routing, all, all that? No, it was supposed to be purely managerial. I was not supposed to touch a code. Oh, I was okay. not supposed oh, right. to. It was purely a survey. The idea was. You need to learn English. You need to just get a few marks to get the top you can get. Uh, just go and relax. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I arrived there, Professor Golden had other plans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he gave me this paper to read. And I've never read a paper, a scientific paper in my life. In Italy, industrial engineering is a cohort of 350. And you don't really read at least when I was a student, you will never read a scientific paper. Mm-hmm. And I read this paper and I'm like, okay, I understood it. I explained, we discussed it. And then he said, okay, I want to do the same, but I would like to do it with a genetic algorithm. And I go back to my office and I'm like, I knew what a genetic algorithm was, but I've never coded anything in my life. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> you, you, didn't, you didn't take any, any coding classes during the, the undergrad period? There was one coding class about the C, mm-hmm. and it was all paper-based. Ah, okay. Ouch. So I never touched a computer. I never even installed a, a, an editor for mm-hmm. typing in any code. And it was first year of undergrad, so it was like five years after. Mm-hmm. And then Professor Golden passes by my office, knocks at the door, and I said, I'm sorry, can I ask you a question that I didn't understand? And he said, yes. And I said, do I really need to code the genetic algorithm? <laughs> <laughs> I remember his face. He had a smile on his face. And then he said, not overnight. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the panic that night. What do I do now? Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Like, so you probably have... You should have freaked out, right, to, to get into Installed MATLAB and day by day we managed at the end. Uh, it was an interesting experience. So you, you, oh, you coded in MATLAB then? Yeah, that was the recommendation to start uh-huh. with because I only had three months abroad. Mm-hmm. And when they realized that I was basically starting from no computer programming experience at all, uh, then we decided to go for the easiest route Uh and uh, then yes I did the project in MATLAB to start with and then when I went back to Italy um, given that I was interested to start a PhD they founded me for a few months and then I translated all the code in C++ Ah. so I started to learn C++ so like self-taught or you, you took any classes uh, I will say self-taught, mm-hmm. but at the same time, um, my PhD was in a computer engineering department. Mm-hmm. So self-taught with a lot of friends that would help every time I was banging my head in the wall. <laughs> no, sure. But I mean, that for the masters, I'm saying you, you solved it, like everything in MATLAB, or you, you had to code in C++, you had to translate it to C++ for completing the, the master's work. I think the master results were the ones in MATLAB, but okay. then when we submitted for publication, the results were mm-hmm. in C++. Okay, so that brings me to so my next question. Uh, where was it your first publication? And which, uh, which I mean, I'm saying that you can you can say like the conf- conference or journal and the co-authors do, do you, because I think that's a great achievement, right? When, when you get our first yeah, paper no, in we, Africa. I was very well supported because when I went back, this paper was at a stage in which we had to replicate the results, but basically the ideas were there. Um, so I think we, I had a few 
month of contra research contract from my supervisor that basically managed to keep me keep supporting me until the next PhD scholarship will be available. And uh, that's the time in which we finalized this paper that went into George's. Oh. And uh, yeah, that got accepted basically the first month I was during my PhD. So I started with a paper published that was the work of my master, really. That's great. So George, uh, uh, you know, the, the Journal of the Operation Research Society uh, from UK, uh, it's, it's very known mm -hmm. in our field. And it's like, it's a very, very nice way to start. Uh, yeah, your publishing lucky. career, <laughs> yeah. So you had like uh, the Professor Vigo there, Professor Golden also were the, the co-authors or just, do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were all co-authors of that paper, yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing, yeah. And do you remember the first time you've been to a conference? That's also something like when you present you know, something in international conference in English, I think it also it's also something that uh, yeah, no, remember, can first remember conference was uh, um, the time in which I was starting my PhD. So basically one year after my master period in the US, because there was a conference held at my university. It was the Italian War Conference, but it's quite a good standard international conference. And it was held within my un by my university. So my supervisor said, hey, you're going to be giving a talk. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was my master work, really. And uh, I still remember I was in the last day in a huge auditorium, like 500 people auditorium. And uh, Professor Speranza was a chair. Claudia uh -huh. was also in the session. So it was like all big names. And I was <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> and I clearly remember there was um, Roberto. Uh, Baldacci. Okay, yeah. And I'm Roberto sure. was one of the um, was working on another beginning the, to work on another paper with me and and uh, Professor Vigo. Yeah, on the heterogeneous fleet, right? Routing problem. Yeah. Right. And he was terrified. He was like, "Oh gosh, what are you going to do?" I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I I still remember. I still have this clear feeling of my legs shaking going up to this. <laughs> podium to speak yeah 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 uh, I, I, at the end. yes I, I remember first time i i presented mine uh it was in the brazilian or conference it's a super mm -hmm. nice conference uh, uh and it was in fortaleza and we mm -hmm. went there by car it was like a 10-hour drive uh and, and then the, my my session was kind of packed and there was uh, mauricio has ended there and yeah i was presenting some grasp work so it was oh, like, no. yeah, yeah. So when it, when it came to the point to describe grasp, I said, look, I'm, f I'm feeling embarrassed to do that. So, so the audience kind of uh, liked it because it was really kind of awkward. Uh, but yeah, I, I did it, lot. These are all part of our uh, I think learning process. Go with the flow. If you let the fear block you. And also expect that every time you do something like speaking at a conference or submitting a paper or going to teach and you need to be 100% ready, I think you will lose so many opportunities. So I'm trying to force myself, trying to be not so much of a perfectionist and sometimes accept that I will do things to a standard that is okay just because otherwise you will never get into wonderful opportunities. Yes, for Did sure. I want to tell you, Anna, the story uh. of my first time that I taught in UK. Um, I, in, I was in a mathematics uh, department. Yeah, yeah, in Southampton, you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I visited you there in 2012. Yes, you did. <laughs> I think this was probably 2000 and. Uh, at that I time, you were writing the, the, book the book chapter on the pickup and delivery. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I would discuss some things because I was working quite a lot on, the, on some uh, related problems. And uh, we had a nice time there. It was awesome. We went to London then. We met my one of my cousins, Sanjeev. <laughs> he was yes. there. He took us around. And I think we went to a Thai restaurant. It was, it was great uh, in, in London. I don't know if you remember that. But yeah. 
But it is one of the biggest achievements in my career is that I managed to get Anand out of Brazil <laughs> and uh, to the UK. I don't think there is many other people that managed to convince him to. Yeah, um, you should be proud. To Europe. Yeah, I should be proud. Yeah, yeah that was just before the, the Euro trip. Like uh, I, it has been ages I haven't uh, had any vacation. I actually have, we've, I've been to Europe one year earlier, but I met you and uh, in, in route, mm -hmm. right? We can get get yeah. back to that later on. Uh, but uh, yes, yes, like uh, uh, it was it was wonderful. Uh, it was a super nice experience. Uh, but you were telling that you were telling something, right, about uh, the yeah. No, I was. Um, the story goes that I was um, for the first time I was basically teaching as a lecturer or assistant professor mm -hmm. in the mathematics department, and my English was fluent, but not perfect because my education was still uh, in. Uh, in Italian, so the technical terms sometimes wouldn't come too natural to me. So I knew what I was teaching, but still with a few bumps here and there. Sure, that it's, and, it's normal. Uh, they, I was teaching mathematical programming, so integer programming, branch and bound, network flows. And you that sent sort of me stuff. those notes. You sent me the notes of your mathematical programming course. Mm -hmm. I still have them, I think. <laughs> and. Uh, and after like two weeks after I finished the class, they told me that I, one of my students was the daughter of Professor Beasley. And I'm like, no. <laughs> really? John Beasley? Wow. <laughs> you somewhat end up that getting... That's the best getting, teaching getting, of getting... my life. But yeah. <laughs> they didn't tell me in advance. They yeah. told me afterwards. You somehow managed to bump into these big names and, and, and also their family members. Not only... <laughs> Mm, yeah, I was like, oh, I hope I taught it okay. <laughs> Afterwards, I thought of it. And yeah, but let's let's. Yeah, but let's let's continue on the PhD saga, right? Mm. So you you oh. now now that uh, you you at some point uh, you eventually got the scholarship and you started working mm -hmm. with big names, uh, and I'm sure it it was like a, a very nice experience and. Uh, again, like picking up the topic, uh, you just went with the flow of things, with the flow, or you just you you picked something that was you had the the option to choose something. What happened? Um, we knew we wanted to do something about routing simply because it was in the domain of expertise of um, Professor Vigo. It was in the domain of expertise of uh, Roberto Valdacci. So we thought about we looked at different variants. And at the time, we thought, okay, the heterogeneous has not been studied very well. But <laughs> <laughs> I think some of your friends then came in as well. Yeah. <laughs> it was not just me realizing that. In my so defense, they became your friends too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, they are an amazing team. Yeah. Now, the funny thing is that we started to study. And again, I was, it was eight months that I was coding and I was learning on my own. So they said, okay, it's probably better to start with a um, branch and cut because it's a more incremental way of learning. I never used Cplex before, so you need to learn the callbacks. You, oh, need, yeah. I mean, you need to yeah, go sure. step by step. <laughs> I know. Uh, so we were still doing the cuts and thinking of proofs and stuff. And then we realized that basically um, much, much more effective branch and price and cuts were coming up. Uh, so that was a sort of a step back, but um, uh, we had to basically change a bit the direction of my PhD, and that can happen. You cannot uh, make a plan and usually keep on, on with that plan for three or five or six years. Uh, it's often the case, especially if it's a well-known problem that someone else can study at the same time. Um, so yes. I I did a couple of papers on that topic. One is a survey, the other one is... Uh, There's a book chapter. I think it's the survey is the book chapter. Yeah, 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 I, yeah that was also why it took two or three months as well. From 2008, um, I think that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember really well that because I, I, I had this, like, once you dropped, I started also working in the heterogeneous fleet. I think to this date, we still have one of the best uh, heuristics for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's why I came, I had to, to, to uh, check the literature and all that. So I, I, I came across your work. I think you have a journal paper as, as well on the topic, right? Uh, yeah, it's on networks. Networks, I think. yeah, yeah. And then I started to do what I currently do. Uh, but it's probably not the most 
effective way of doing research. I don't recommend it if you want to really reach the top journals. And But I've started to just work on problems that I find interesting and fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I started to work on an application, for example, the distribution of uh, food to supermarkets, and we did uh, practical heuristics for that. Uh, uh, we started to work on uh, the TSP with, with uh, pickup and delivery, but with handling. Yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, that was a very cute one. We yeah. totally enjoyed that paper. Um, and then probably the cluster, we came up with that variant. And um, But yes, since then, I've uh, been probably not the most pragmatic researcher in terms of what can go on which journal. I tend to just look for projects that I find uh, interesting, fun from a mathematical perspective, or that can be used in practice. So. I'm trying to also look at problems that really have a relevance and an application in a specific industry. I totally enjoy even looking for solutions that are simpler, but they are really implemented in practice. Yes, that's that's a very nice perspective. And uh, at some point, I think you went to Canada. Am I right? Was mm-hmm. it during the PhD or after that? Yeah, that was my second year of PhD. Ah, okay. I work with uh, Professor Scordo and uh, uh, Laporte. Yeah, you ha- you have to talk uh, about that, of course. I think that was some. It was a very cold time, <laughs> but very interesting. Obviously, it's a fantastic research center where the uh, colleagues and the atmosphere is so collegial, but also so motivating, and the standard of research is so high. A uh, great opportunity. Yes, and uh, do do you like? Did you work in any particular topic that was uh, you already had started, or you you went uh, and and had a brand new research topic when you uh, moved there temporarily? We started with a topic, and it didn't work out. It mm. was so difficult. I couldn't get my. I mean, we couldn't get uh, fantastic results. Uh, we started with the multi trip VR. It's a very nasty. Yeah, I know <laughs> that. I think I worked that to... at some point. Yeah, I know the problem. Yeah, it, it was difficult. So we got some lower bounds, but they were not good at all. We realized that quite after two or three months that we wouldn't be able to solve realistic sized instances. I think even Roberto Roberti managed managed to to kick to, to solve it quite effectively, mm-hmm. but it took him quite some time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yes, we worked on that for two or three months, and then we, we switched uh, on to the TSP with the cap and delivery and uh, handling costs. Um, so yeah, sometimes you also need to just change direction, I'm afraid. Yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, in the mid to ta- like the, the, the 2005 to 2010, and like mm. it was more, it was that that uh, that's a competition between the like the Brazilian team and the Italian team, and yeah. also the people from Denmark, and and the of Valiant, course Montreal, yeah, people from from Canada. And uh, that period, like if you wanted to do something, you should be very like you should have been very brave. And I know, uh, yeah. I know the feeling from like I'm, say, I'm saying I'm saying this uh, about the uh, the intro programming and the exact algorithms. Uh, you know, it was the time where there's a branch. Branch cut and price. Some some like to call branch mm-hmm. price and cut or whatever. Uh, you you can pick whatever you want, but uh, it's uh, it's when things were popping out and uh, it was like a, really a breakthrough. Big competition about time and oh that yeah. person is starting to study that and mm. it was a, yeah it was a it was a horse racing at the same time trying to improve yes. like the the bounds and it was it was nice like I mean I I I, I could. I was witnessing that by from the like uh, the Brazilian perspective at the same time. Mm-hmm. At the same time, yeah, I was following. Got to witness it. <laughs> yeah, well, also, all the <laughs> yeah, but they did a, they did a super yeah. work. Yeah, but I mean, it was a super. Uh, it was it was nice to see like to, to see the, the, that progress, right? In terms of now, oh, only yes. recently they came up with some super uh, like state of the art exact algorithm mm-hmm. that's quite complicated with a lot of stuff, the labeling algorithm and 
yeah it's all with ngs you know at uh, that time was very very nice like uh, uh, it's things were really emerging and i think we, we experienced mm. a nice period in terms of developing of development of i think so exactly it was very exciting i think we arrived at the point in which some of the foundation ideas were already there so we didn't arrive at the point in which for example the main metaheuristics were coming up the main frameworks and the idea of uh, column generation i think we arrived at least i arrived a bit later than the main ideas mm -hmm. Um, but we saw them developing and growing and uh, uh, taking a certain shape and a certain research direction. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, uh, I remember Shaw telling me that uh, his uh, the first version of his branch cutting process algorithm is just with a simple dynamic programming with preventing two cycle and some capacity mm -hmm. cuts, and he could he could really at that time with just that simple version of the of that algorithm they could solve open problems, and that was a real leap. I would say uh, uh, at that at that time, uh, of course, n not the only one. That Even though the simple code of uh, Eduardo is not a simple code oh, for no. normal human beings. No, but what they end up <laughs> what they ended up publishing in uh, Matt Prague mm -hmm. later, they he, he I remember he called uh, uh, Renato Werneck to do some uh, very very efficient dynamic programming, and then there are other, there were other people involved. So the 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 the, the the, they, they did something more complex and they they had to include the severe PSAP package to, to separate cuts. So there were a lot things became really, I, I actually, I had access to that code. I had to adapt it to, to, to the VRP with simultaneous pickup delivery. And it was mm -hmm. like, a, I, I think five or six people had code and it was, it was really, uh, oh, yeah. No, yeah, it's a little piece I of history, but once in, yeah. I put my hands once in one of those code and I said, no, this is not for me. <laughs> very hard stuff yeah i mean it's it's a labyrinth and if you are not a software engineer that knows really how to how a code is structured and how you touch one box at a time and it's not super easy yeah. that's i think the main bottleneck for newcomers in the field you cannot really start doing exact methods unless you have someone there sitting next to you and teaching you almost step by step uh, 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 which yeah. are the tricks. I'm fully aware. Uh, I, I can relate to that. And I had the privilege to work with uh, great guys that, that helped me a lot. Uh, and Eduardo Show, Arthur Pessoa. Arthur Pessoa is just, many people know Eduardo Show, but Arthur Pessoa is a genius. Uh, uh, he's great. Uh, yeah. And he's a super kind and humble guy. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's a, he's a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have like Italy, US, mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. I know where you're going. And I, now I, know now, I think you, you, like, you went east, right? <laughs> For your first position? Yes. Yeah, I was missing the east direction, didn't I? Yes, I ended up in Istanbul following who became my husband. Oh, sure. So yes, for uh, my first... I went first for an exchange. I was uh, uh, very kindly hosted by Professor Haltinen for um, a few months in a summer at Basic University in the Industrial Engineering Department. Another fantastic time of my life with uh, amazing, amazing friends. Um, and then uh, I found a job there. So for one year, I taught as an assistant professor in Industrial Engineering at Kadiras University. And I managed to get married. <laughs> <laughs> That's some sort of achievement, if you like. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think your first, <laughs> your first work, I mean, your first job was in, in Istanbul then. Mm -hmm. Your first, like, like, yes. And like you were, like, you were like, called, like, they call it a lecturer or teaching assistant? What? Assistant professor. Assistant professor. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. No. Yeah, yeah, I found a job there. It was not easy at all, actually, because when you apply as a foreigner, they are like, why are you looking for a job here? I mean, they were all very skeptical, but um, I managed to find a job. Uh, this university welcomed me. They were very open-minded uh, and I worked there for one year. And how was the experience of living in Istanbul? Uh, this very mixed, uh, real salad of very cultures. Mixed. And 
It's the most beautiful and fascinating city. Um, but how could I say? I was commuting. I was commuting in public transport every day mm. and with the people, the simple people that were going to work uh, in the Grand Bazaar from the sure, Asian sure. side. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> But I could perceive the people not being peaceful and not being... I mean, in Italy, people are grumpy, <laughs> but there is an underlying happiness and peacefulness. Uh, whereas in Turkey, I was perceiving this feeling of people being a bit more angry. Mm. And it was not exactly clicking with my my way of being and the way in which I'm... I was brought up. Mm -hmm. uh, so as much as I love the country and I love going back and... Um, yeah, it's very I, beautiful, I, the city. Yeah, Istanbul is great. It's yeah, an so. amazing place with fantastic opportunities and uh, I never spend enough time there. Mm -hmm. And the food is amazing. The friends are so warm and uh, welcoming. But at the same time, I didn't feel it was the place in which I wanted to grow my child because it was... A culture that was quite different than the one in which I was brought up. Ah, okay. So that was probably 2010, 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, around there. Yeah. So probably, that. Yeah. Yeah. So we met in 2011 in Sitges in Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, and I remember that that that's that, uh, after I think I saw that I, I the the presentation by Professor Vigo on the TSP with pickup and delivery and the handling cost. That's why I remember it pretty well because I had I was working a similar problem back then, uh, and then I invited you to work. Uh, I came and yeah, it was just having I don't know after some some session, uh, I just uh, came there like uh, and and I kindly asked you if you could collaborate. And then I don't know if you remember you said sure send me sure. <laughs> what do you have. <laughs> And I know it can be like, uh, you know, in conferences and uh, an unknown and random guy approaching you and asking for a collaboration. Uh, but uh, that was very important for, for, for me also personally. Uh, okay. And then I, I, would not, I would have never imagined after almost 10 years, next year is mm -hmm. going to be 10 years, that we'll be still collaborating. And yeah. I don't know how many... Do we have to get maybe half a I dozen? Never yeah, them. yeah, that, that should be at least quite a few now, yeah, and all a lot of fun. <laughs> Working yeah. with uh, Anand and his team is amazing. No, yeah, no, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not just Anand that is amazing, but he also has a fantastic team of students. I had the privilege of visiting them once I managed to get a small grant, and I just got onto a plane and I was hosted by the family of Anna. And, <laughs> um, it's amazing. And the way in which his students are motivated to work, to learn, uh, they're all humble, but they are also incredibly knowledgeable about OR. It's very hard to find good students these days. The students of Anand are top notch. I mean, I cannot find that other uh, students getting out of a master or an undergrad with the same level of uh, computer programming skills and OR uh, understanding. Of course, uh, you're being very kind. <laughs> Thank you for no, that. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, I mean, you, you, you work with Valton, right? So Valton was there with you and uh, Marcus. Marcos. Yeah, he was not exactly my student, but uh, I worked with him uh, together with Professor Luis Satoru Ochi, and uh, mm -hmm. we collaborated quite a lot. And Marcos is is very nice. I think I, I, I am sure you had yeah, a nice experience with him. Yeah, yeah, he's a Marcus very dear guy. Amazing. Valton is a brilliant student. And then you work with Vito. Uh, Vito. Vito was like 19 years old when we submitted the paper. Yeah, I think he's the youngest uh, co-author of Professor Laporte. He confirmed mm -hmm. that. So <laughs> that's quite an achievement. You see, if you see how many co-authors he had, I think. A few little funny records. We yeah, had Vito was he was scoring already Brescian Prize when he was 17. You know, so I made it. That's what the crazy stuff we do here. Uh, he was an athlete, yeah. actually. He was he was in swimming, so I made use of that discipline and all his competitiveness to to push Your him. Students are amazing. So. I don't know how you manage what you feed them, but <laughs> sending me the recipes. <laughs> yeah, I need the same recipes. I think it's just because since in in our in our case, since we don't have a PhD program, unfortunately, uh, we have to 
hunt with whatever we have. So uh, I, I made them try to learn the, the, the advanced stuff as, earlier, as early as possible so they can actually contribute. And by the time they finish their undergrad, they can come uh, to the master's with a PhD-like level and then can, they can mm -hmm. do some, some uh, we, we, yeah. it's, it's very hard to be very, really ambitious, but I, I just uh, try to, to, to push them and to encourage them. And, and of course, it's all these uh, experiences of, you know, uh, when they, they you, you also had the opportunity to work with Rodrigo, Bruno, other, other students, like mm -hmm. other students of mine. And uh, for them, yeah, for yeah. their career, it's really mm -hmm. nice. They, they uh, you met Teobaldo also, so. Mm -hmm. I think it's no, they're amazing. Cool. It's a uh, up and coming group. I yeah. think everyone will get to know about Farai, but they didn't yet <laughs> because uh, you are building a fantastic uh, team of researchers over there. Yeah, you're doing a fantastic. No, thank you very much. Well, of course, you're, again, you're um, you're being very very kind. Uh, I think so. <laughs> that's what, exactly what I think. Uh, and you, after Istanbul, I think uh, you you went again west uh, to England, to Southampton, right? Southampton, yes. Uh, we were for three years in Southampton. I was in the mathematics department. Mm -hmm. um, so we spent three years over there. Uh, and we made a very nice a paper time. with Professor Potts, right? On yes, scheduling, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You, you were the first. My first scheduling paper is actually with you, uh, and you only draw the attention to me by yeah. okay. Look, this problem is not there very far from routing. Why I can't you... crack it. I came after a, a talk. Yeah, I think I've heard a talk from someone. Yeah, in Southampton, yeah. and I said, I think you can adjust your code in like a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, sure. Then it took us two years to finish the paper, as you remember. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the usual. But uh, at least we, 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 we made some very nice progress. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I know this, like, uh, you know, I, I just attended a talk. I did this, all this, this thing uh, that you can, uh, again, the order acceptance scheduling problem. We didn't work together, unfortunately, but you, again, it was the same uh, situation. You that's a cat that is that's really okay, yeah. <laughs> going to make a bit of a scene now, I think. He's a bit of a diva, my cat. Sorry uh, about okay. that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we, we did not end up working with that. But uh, uh, you suggested that topic. Uh, uh, that it mm -hmm. was very, very... And we end up uh, uh, actually uh, working with uh, a student here and, and with Artu Pesu as well. Uh, yeah, okay. but then again, we had like the cluster VRP and then scheduling once the again with Vitor. Yeah, mm -hmm. ah, yeah, the TSPB draft limits quite was a, the work. We, we did publish quite a, a few good things in the time. Yeah. You know, that time was very productive. I think being in a mathematics department also helped. Uh, there is quite a focus on research. Um, so it was very productive, yes, and the OR paper came up at the time. Ah, so yeah. it was very, very, very good. Yeah, yeah, on the, cl the cluster of ERP you had there that very... Mm. I saw, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that I saw that the, the draft limits presentation. I think by ba Marielle Christensen, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was your idea to work on yeah, that. Yeah, and then I made you prove something. Uh, remember that? You yes. <laughs> oh, on your board. That's the board. <laughs> yeah, it. that board there. Yeah. We were trying to prove the dominance of two formulations, and yeah. we couldn't crack the yeah. the proof. Yeah. Uh, but then we managed. I managed to convince you that the proof was fine by writing it and writing it on that board that you the back. I think you had the first draft on the plane, and then here you you we finally we 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 finished up, and it was very it was nice, like uh, uh, yeah. some a bit of theoretical work, and then finally uh, you during all this period, I think uh, Alan came, right? In yeah, that was. A very busy time again when I change job a lot of things happen at the same time in my life usually so when I was five months pregnant we decided to interview in Bath mostly to leverage possible promotions for not me actually it was just yeah let's just try and as always I always put myself into trouble when I try <laughs> something new <laughs> Because when we came to Bath, we fell in love for the city, we fell in love for the colleagues. And uh, the other thing is, I did a job interview with a huge tummy of a five-month <laughs> pregnant 
woman, so I was never ever expecting a job offer. And actually, they immediately the dean called me back and said, "We loved you. Uh, we are willing to wait." Uh, and I said, "Well, if I get so much uh, appreciation and respect, and uh, they also value the fact that a woman can take a break for maternity, I think this might be the place for us." And that's how we moved with a. <clears throat> two months old the child had to bath uh, that, that's that's so how long have you been there four years or no it's a bit longer actually yeah. it's uh, five years and a half five for me Gunesh is six yeah, years yeah we moved yeah, when Alan was just I mean Gunesh moved when Alan was just born mm -hmm. and I moved as soon as I came back from maternity leave ah okay and 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 then the the, the big question and how do you manage maternity teaching, research, wife, and mm. administrative work, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. It's a game, but it's difficult. Uh, my research has been slower. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to do about it. Um, uh, the admin work is quite demanding in a management school, and I've been doing more and more admin. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a mom of a very busy and energetic boy without grandparents around. And uh, I accepted the fact that for me that one is a priority and uh, I will never forget myself if I in the future didn't give enough attention to my child. Mm. And um, so, yes, I've tried to conjugate as much as I can research and uh, teaching and admin duties. Uh, but the priority for me is my child and my family. So I'm trying to have more reasonable hours and leave the nights and the weekends to my family. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's not easy to handle. I mean, we are so passionate about our work and we like to submit the paper and get the results done. Uh, but at the same time, I also want to think that this as a stage in my career. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think of myself, I still see that I will have at least 28 years before <laughs> retirement. Mm -hmm. And my child in 10 years will be out from my life probably and won't even want to see me anymore. So I think I want to value and uh, give him as much attention and care as I think he deserves. Yeah, but and, uh, I'm hoping to catch up with research in a few years' time. <laughs> Who knows? He may end up in operations research, and you'll not get away from you or you from no, him. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, I and about. I mean, what about the future now? Uh, you have. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll you'll be. Uh, keen to, uh, to advise and supervise PhD students mm. and uh, w what do they have to do if they want to work with you? Like, uh, how, what will be the process? Will they, they have to write an email or uh, they, have, they have to look for grants themselves? So what, what mm -hmm. tips can you give for those that are interested in working with you? Uh, yeah, great students with uh, fantastic motivation are always welcome. And uh, I think getting in touch with a potential supervisor is always a good starting point. The PhD is very much also, um, it's a very close work with your supervisor. So you really need to like also the person, not just the topic or the institution. So don't just apply randomly for PhDs with uh, supervisors that you don't know well. You need to find the person you click with. Definitely, yeah. Uh, in the UK, uh, the PhD program is three years long. The first year, you might need to take a few units. If you want, you can also take an integrated program, like one year of Master, in Man yeah, master of Research in Management, plus three additional year years of research. So it's a short track project uh, with respect to the US or Canadian standard. Um, we are looking for students that have some computer programming skills, ideally C, C++, Java, something of that sort, and some operational research background. Um, I tend to work very closely with students. So 
meeting them weekly by weekly if there is a need even every day if they're stuck in the court as long as they work hard and I see the results of their work and they do their very best. Uh, they need to be ambitious and they need to be hardworking. Uh, scholarships are very competitive, but uh, if a candidate is very good, um, usually there is one or two positions available within the school and we are up for a good fight mm. to convince a committee that uh, the student deserves mm -hmm. that position. Um, so we try to, I try to answer every single candidate that sends me an email. No matter how good or how bad they are, I will at least give you an answer that can be very straightforward and say, look, mm, you might not be the best fit for this role. Um, so get in touch. Uh, they, it's hard to get scholarships in the UK, especially for international students, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so try to get in touch early on because the funding starts to be allocated around February, but at the time it means that all your paperwork has to be approved. You need to have a set of interviews with your supervisor. Mm, so the earlier better, because if your application is in and you have support letters in place, then every funding available, you would be taken into consideration. Okay, yeah. So for those that are interested, they, you gave all the hints, the tips and the advice. So I, I can say that working with Maria is uh, it's a super nice experience and we have a lot of fun. I think that's the best part. Uh, like we worked with many, many people and uh, you were very welcoming to my students and, and all that. So uh, I, I mean, I, I strongly encourage uh, if you if you think that you fit this background that Maria just mentioned, uh, I'm sure you'll 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 do great and have a very nice time working with her. She's amazing. And I end up working with Anna as well yeah. because we always have research projects in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yes, uh, but well, Maria, I mean, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you know, it's, it's you, Anna. I'm honored. Time time just like went very fast. I did not even realize it was already there. That it's been quite oh, a lot yeah. we were talking, and uh, uh, I mean. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, happy holidays. I, I hope we have a thank you very much. You best. too, and you're fabulous, man. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, say hi to Ganesh and Alan, and of course to your family in Italy, your parents. Uh, I, I just hope next yes. year is less hectic, yeah. and yeah, and you, I wish you a, a very uh, prosperous and healthy uh, 2021. And uh, yeah. <laughs> You uh, too. Let's hope for a, a, a more reasonable year next year. A more standard year yeah. will be fine. <laughs> yeah, we, we had, uh, we had, uh, uh, we unfortunately, had to cancel our trip. Uh, my wife was so upset okay. that we, we wanted to visit you guys. We're supposed to come to the UK. Yeah, and I mean, uh, she loves the, the UK and all that. And mm -hmm. uh, next uh, time. Yeah, we had uh, we have a lot of things planned. We we were planning to visit Liverpool and all that because you're like, you're all Beatles fans. And unfortunately, we, we just, uh, because of all the, the pandemic and all that, we could not make it. Um, but who knows, we can try to see each other soon. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, let's hope for the best. So thank you, thank you so very much. Grazie mille. And see you. <laughs> and I wish all the best for this series of interviews. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> bye. Ciao. Bye, Anand. Ciao. Thank you. Bye, bye. Ciao.